Welcome to today's webinar, Single-Use Endoscopy Solutions, Comparing Costs and Outcomes. This is Ashley Becker, HFMA's Client Services Specialist, and I will be moderating today's session. It is my pleasure to welcome today's speakers. Ian Hayslip is an Associate Health Economist at AMBU Inc. on their Health Economics and Market Access team. Ian helps with outcomes research, cost analysis, and value communication for AMBU's visual visualization products. Before AMBU, Ian spent two years in federal consulting, working across multiple divisions within the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Jens Kemp is AMBU Inc.'s Vice President of Marketing and oversees all marketing activities in the United States and Canada. In addition to managing product management, digital and content marketing efforts, he also manages health econ economic and market access and clinical research activities. Before taking over U.S. marketing, Kemp was responsible for global business development for AMBU, including portfolio strategy for new growth platforms, strategic partnerships, and driving mergers and acquisitions. With that, Jens, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to present today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm excited to, to share some uh, insights on the single-use uh, endoscopy market. Um, so um, with, with the introduction from Ashley, let's jump straight to the uh, agenda today. So um, what we hope to achieve today is really to uh, talk about the uh, single-use endoscopy market and why uh, the market is uh, starting to transition over to single-use. Um, we'll talk about what are some of the clinical benefits of, of single-use, and also, what is the financial case for single use? Um, what is the cost uh, of single use versus uh, reusable? And some of the challenges uh, that really exist today with uh, finding out what the true costs are of using a reusable uh, endoscopy. So we'll also give a, a brief introduction to uh, flexible endoscopy. We'll talk a little bit about where the um, flexible endoscopy market uh, has come from, and basically what are some of the key drivers uh, that is allowing single-use endoscopes to uh, become uh, more and more proliferant in, in the market uh, today. And then uh, Ian will uh, spend some time really breaking down the cost of, of reusable and all the different components that really has to be considered when uh, looking at the cost of uh, reusable uh, endoscopy. Uh, and so hopefully uh, this will provide a, a good overview of um, single-use endoscopy, reusable endoscopy, and, and what are the key drivers that is driving the market towards uh, single-use. So with that, um, I thought I'll brief briefly introduce the company uh, we work for. Um, so Ian and I both work for, for Ampu. We're a Danish medical company, but with a large footprint here in the US. We've been in the US market for many decades. Um, and really what Ampu is known for is uh, single use uh, devices today uh, within many different areas, uh, anesthesia. And most recently in the past decade, we've pioneered the emergence of single-use endoscopes and continue to uh, bring to market uh, new single-use endoscopes. Um, we're a global company, and so we control every uh, part of the um, value chain. We have our own manufacturing. We have our own uh, direct sales organizations throughout the world, um, and uh, really in all aspects, uh, a global uh, company. We have been recognized as the um, leader in single-use uh, endoscopes, and um, we had uh, the um, consultancy company Frost and Sullivan um, really um, uh, announce uh, just this year that um, Ambu, um, in in all aspects, uh, is the most innovative single-use uh, uh, company, endoscope company. Of course, we are very proud of that, and that is a reflection of you know, the fact that we have a very large portfolio of single-use devices and have a very large scale uh, compared to other companies in the market. But there are many companies that have introduced single-use uh, endoscopes to the market in many different clinical areas. So I'm sure you will be seeing a, a lot of demand from uh, physicians to consider implementing single-use endoscopes uh, 
for many different types of procedures, and that will only increase uh, in, in the future. So let's talk a little bit about uh, reusable flexible endoscope and where we really come from when it, when, when it comes to flexible endoscopy. But before we dive into that, uh, we have uh, a polling question. Uh, and I think Laurie has just launched uh, a uh, poll uh, where you can enter the answer. But uh, really knowing what you know today, uh, what do you think are the main industry drivers behind the transition from reusable to single-use endoscopes? Is it uh, mainly patient safety concerns? Uh, uh, concerns that you could potentially contract an infection from a contaminated endoscope that maybe hasn't been cleaned the right way or maybe has been damaged, uh, which has allowed bacteria to, to harbor in the endoscope? Is it a question of cost? Uh, and economics uh, that is driving it? Is it workflow and efficiency? Is it um, basically the ability to uh, reallocate resources uh, and reschedule uh, workflows uh, in a completely different way uh, or maybe all of the above? All right, I see we have the answers uh, come up. So um, interestingly, quite a few uh, said patient safety as, as the main driver. Uh, and then uh, economics and, and workflow, uh, independently, not that much, but, but overall, the majority find all of the above three. And that is correct, because it is really not just one thing that is driving the market um, towards single use. Um, in some areas of endoscopy, it's a high concern for, for uh, infections. Uh, in other endoscopy areas, it's really about the, uh, the uh, additional productivity and revenue impact that uh, single use can bring uh, and, uh, and the efficiency and workflow uh, that, that can be achieved. So uh, thanks for, for that. And, and then let's move into kind of the history of uh, flexible uh, endoscopy. And we've really come a long way since the 1950s where we basically uh, had the first attempt to provide some means of looking inside the body of a patient. And so this had been a, uh, you know, a wish for a long time. Um, there had been a wish to look into the stomach of patients for a long time. And so, Olympus, uh, which is the, the market leader in uh, reusable endoscopy, uh, was asked at the time to see if they can develop uh, a scope that could be used by gastroenterologists uh, at the time. And so what they came up with was this uh, gastro camera, which really was a very basic device uh, that had a photographic lens at the end. Uh, and then uh, the images from the stomach was captured on a um, monographic film that then had to be developed for in order to view the pictures uh, at a later time. So really a quite basic uh, device, but really allowed uh, some advances in the detection of, of stomach cancer. Um, so uh, a, a very uh, good first attempt to, to look inside the body um, and was quite successful at the time. Then in the, in the late 50s and the beginning of the 60s, a new material was developed in the US, which was glass fiber. And, and these glass fiber materials allowed light from one end to be transmitted to the other end uh, very efficiently. And so if you bundle a bunch of these uh, glass fibers together, you could create uh, an image. Um, and this basically allowed for the first time real-time view of uh, images from the inside. So um, this became extremely uh, popular and it also expanded the use of endoscopy from just the stomach into basically any orifice uh, in the body. So they started manufacturing bronchoscopes which allowed um, physicians to look into the lungs. They developed cystoscopes that allowed physicians to look into the bladder. Uh, they developed uh, colonoscopes uh, for the um, intestine, and then, of course, uh, ENT scopes for the ear, nose, and throat area. Uh, and really, there was a huge uh, proliferation of devices that allowed physicians to diagnose uh, disorders uh, in, in many different areas. So extremely successful. Uh, 
the uh, next advance in endoscopy came uh, in the 80s with the charge coupled device. And that basically was the first time that it was possible to transmit uh, a, an image uh, electronically into an electronic format that allows you to show it on a TV. So now all of a sudden you had a um, image that could be captured in real time and then in real time displayed on a monitor. And so that also opened up a host of opportunities to improve the image with image, image processing technologies. And then of course the um, resolution of the image became better and better. And so what we have today in, in, uh, in 2020 and, and, and beyond is really the area of, of high definition video scopes, very high quality imaging um, with um, CCD and CMOS chips uh, that create very high resolution images and are used for many, many different types of uh, procedures uh, today and really has become an invaluable tool for, for medicine uh, today. All of these uh, devices though, do require extensive uh, cleaning uh, processes to, to be adhered to. So it's a device that is used uh, and then typically, uh, or not typically, and then has to go through an extensive uh, cleaning process, either a, um, a um, high level disinfection process or a sterilization process, all of which is quite harsh on the, on the scopes themselves. So we'll get into more of that uh, later on in the, in the presentation. So as I said, it's, it's really a, a, a very um, a common procedure today. Flexible endoscopy is used uh, more than, uh, in more than 40 million procedures every year, both in the hospital and the ambulatory surgery centers. And even in the office clinics, uh, they are used quite extensively for uh, non-invasive uh, examinations. For example, uh, if you have a, an issue uh, with your larynx or maybe your vocal cords, you can go to an ENT and they will use a scope to investigate um, if there are any damages in, in that region. It's very, um, um, you know, very uh, low uh, invasiveness, so it can be done uh, without uh, much, uh, much uh, uh, pain in the, in the office uh, clinic. The same goes for, for urology. Uh, if you uh, have had bladder cancer, you can typically go to the office and have surveillance of your bladder cancer, uh, which is also not a very invasive uh, procedure. So really uh, a very common procedure uh, these days. So uh, if we look in general uh, on products that are used in hospitals today, the majority of the products uh, in the 1970s were reusable. You had reusable urinary catheters. You had reusable airway tubes or um, uh, endotracheal tubes. Your, your electrodes that was used to capture your ECG was reusable, your resuscitators and so on and so forth. So really all the all products in the 70s were basically reusable. But um, as time grew, there was more and more concern around contamination. And also hospitals found that it was not very efficient to have a lot of uh, labor and staff uh, really um, uh, dedicated to cleaning products all the time. So really, uh, when you look at where we are today, a majority of the products have gone single use uh, as hospitals have found it to be much more efficient um, uh, and cost effective than reusable uh, products. The only product that really has not transitioned or one of the products that haven't transitioned has been the flexible uh, uh, scope, uh, endoscope. And that has been because it's, of course, it's a very complicated instrument and also because the technology hasn't been there to allow uh, that type of product to become uh, single use. But that really changed uh, in the, um, around 2010 uh, where we saw this 
um, proliferation of cell phones with cameras. Uh, those of, of you that are old enough, uh, like me, to to remember, uh, it was it was interesting when the first cameras came on the phones. They were terrible, but yet it was fascinating for people to have these cameras. And all of the companies that were developing the phones, uh, the phones quickly saw it as a way to differentiate themselves by offering more and more pixels in the cameras. And as you know, these phones were sold uh, in uh, 100 millions uh, uh, a year, of course you saw uh, a net, an exponential increase in the quality and an, an exponential decrease in the cost of these sensors. So really the sensors became much, much cheaper and also much, much better uh, very, very quickly. And all of a sudden you had a new camera sensor technology that really allowed for the design of single-use endoscopes. So that really was the catalyst for the single-use uh, endoscopy uh, market. And so you can see from this chart, this basically shows um, how many single-use endoscopes that have been sold in the past uh, decade. And so 10 years ago, when the first products came to market, these were quite basic uh, airway scopes. Uh, and um, they weren't sold in huge quantities. Um, but today, 10 years later, this has significantly changed. Now we're seeing a lot of different um, single-use scopes in many different clinical areas. And last year, uh, more than 1 million single-use endoscopes were sold in the market. Uh, and um, that number is expected to significantly increase uh, in the coming years as more and more hospitals uh, convert more of their procedures to, to single use. Um, so really uh, a significant growth uh, in the uh, amount of single use devices used, which is a reflection of, of course, the significantly improved uh, image quality in these devices and also the significantly improved uh, mechanical performance. And so really we're at a point now where um, these single use devices are introduced with high definition imaging. Uh, and um, basically in many respects are uh, com fully comparable to their reusable uh, counterparts. So. So really, there's not any, from an imaging uh, point of view, major reason why the majority of procedures cannot be done with single-use devices. So um, if you look at the overall market and really what's driving uh, the, the, the market to single-use, uh, as we mentioned, it's not just one thing. Um, it's, it's a fact, a, a lot of different factors. We just talked about the, the technology and, 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 and really the fact that the technologies from an imaging sensor uh, point of view, but also in materials technology and so on is evolving so rapidly that it's now possible to develop very high quality uh, single use scopes. And it's possible to drive iterations much, much quicker than a reusable equipment because the typical product life cycle for a reusable endoscope is somewhere between seven to 10 years. And that's because these devices are so expensive to invest in for a hospital uh, that they have to be depreciated before the hospital can invest in the new scope. You know, typically it's, it's uh, six to uh, seven years before they'll consider investing in a new scope. So that really slows down the uh, uh, innovation cycle for reusable. But also we've seen a lot of regulatory uh, support for transitioning to single use. There's been a, a lot of safety communications that have been issued by the FDA on um, really driving more efficient reprocessing and also to transition to single use for certain uh, patients. We also have the clinical societies that are supporting uh, the transition to single use for some uh, indications and, and patients. And that's really helping uh, also drive the environment uh, to, to single use. But the major driver really is the, uh, the economics uh, when hospitals take a deep dive into the cost of their reusable devices, when they look at the efficiencies that they can get from a single-use uh, device, that uh, typically is the main driver uh, in, in, uh, in the hospital's decision to convert to, to single-use. 
So with that, let's let's uh, let's dive into uh, the cost of uh, the reusable devices, and I'll hand it over to to Ian at this point. Thank you, Ian. So we're gonna take a look at the actual cost of reusable endoscopy. Um, so we'll go to the next slide and, and see if you guys can uh, take a take a look at this question and uh, see what your thoughts are. So. What do you think is the main cost driver behind a reusable endoscopy procedure? Uh, is it the endoscopy capital? So the, the scopes themselves, the, the towers, monitors, uh, light sources, uh, the repairs and maintenance that come along with a reusable um, endoscope, uh, the reprocessing process or cycles, uh, whether it be high level disinfection, uh, double high level disinfection or sterilization, um, or is it the outcomes, yeah, the, 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 the cost of cross-contamination, uh, infections, um, increased, uh, you know, wait times and delays, uh, you know, so I'll give you guys a second to, to answer that. Nice little mix. That is, that is what we'd like to see. Uh, so majority of you actually are pretty close. Uh, reprocessing is, is very, very uh, expensive and it could be, it could be the main cost driver. Uh, but it's actually a mix of the of the group. It's actually a pretty good mix of the group, and outcomes are also a very uh, large portion as well uh, for certain uh, reusable endoscopes uh, that drive the cost as well. Uh, so we'll take even a little bit further look in the next few slides and break it down further for you uh, to give you that big that, that the grand scheme of things, the big picture. Uh, so for reusable endoscopes, you you have two main sectors of costs: your direct costs and your indirect costs, and there are individual buckets uh, within each. Uh, so within your direct costs, you have your capital investment. Your direct costs every time you use that scope, um, you're going to be using the the, the reusable scope, the, the video tower itself, and those are very obviously very expensive pieces of equipment, and they're going to depreciate. Uh, they're going to be used multiple times. Uh, it, it's going to generate, you know, potentially lots of repairs, which is that second bucket. The repairs and maintenance, you know, there are service contracts or maintenance agreements uh, that may be in place to help take care of, of scopes that go down um, and handle damaged scopes or degrading scopes as well. And then that final bucket of reprocessing and direct costs. And reprocessing depended upon um, what method, uh, as we, we kind of mentioned a little bit in the, in the polling question, there's multiple methods and it involves lots of different uh, consumables. There's lots of hands-on labor there as well. Uh, it's very time consuming, lots of steps. Uh, when you we combine those with the indirect cost, so the cost of cross-contamination, uh, whether that you, it, it's the cost of treating an infection, as well as the infection rate from particular types of scopes, and the, and the types of infections you commonly see uh, from contaminated scopes. Uh, you combine that with potential delays seen, whether it be the, the operating room or the ICU, uh, waiting for scopes to be turned. Uh, if you have scopes that are out for repair and you need, you're down, you know, now you're, you're working with three instead of five or four, uh, you're, now you're having to wait a little bit longer for those scopes. That can cost some time. You know, those delays will cost some money. And there's also some other complications as well. But when you when you put those two together, you get your total cost uh, for using a reusable endoscope. Uh, and we break it out for, on a per procedure basis. Uh, but when you try to identify these costs within a setting, it's it's pretty difficult at times. So there there is a there is a lack of transparency involved because these the all of these buckets are managed potentially by diff different departments. You know, your capital investment might be handled by a clinical department and your repairs and maintenance might be handled by uh, the biomed department, whereas your reprocessing uh, costs in that bucket might be handled by the infection control or central sterile. Um, so it, it's really difficult at times to identify what the true cost of, the, of an entire uh, reusable endoscopy procedure may be, may be running for a facility. Um, so when we you know we talk with uh, with with folks, it, it definitely you have to you bring that up to speed of like, okay, you're, you're right. We have uh, a lot more that we we're not really even thinking of. There's a lot more that goes on uh, when you're using a reusable endoscope. So uh, the budgets are separate and they sit in different departments. So it's it's really difficult to track. In, in in terms of the outcomes, the infections, that's also very difficult to track. Some some facilities might not track it as, as thoroughly as as some as others. Uh, so that's just difficult and also to attribute maybe to that particular 
scope or procedure. Uh, but that's really what it gets down to for your reasonable endoscopy drivers. You have your direct, your indirect, uh, and then they're handled by different departments. So that's what makes it uh, really difficult to identify um, for, uh, for a facility. Next slide. So as for the direct costs, uh, obviously we mentioned the scopes and the towers, and they're very, very expensive. Lots, you know, lots of components. Uh, they're gonna be you know, hefty up front here. They're gonna depreciate over their lifespan. Uh, and then, you know, there are large volume centers that may even potentially buy additional scopes to handle large volume days. So they won't, you know, they won't have that delay aspect uh, or they might not have to worry about scopes going down. They will always be able to compensate um, for those for those types of situations. Uh, then you also get into the repairs and repairs and reprocessing, you know, kind of go hand in hand a bit. Uh, when you think about it, because depending on the type of reprocessing you uh, you're under, your scopes might be undergoing, um, it could be very aggressive. The sterilization side of reprocessing is very aggressive. Um, it, it could degrade a scope a little quicker. And as the scope gets worn down, obviously it's going to be more prone to damage. Uh, there's scratches on the lens or there's degrading you know, you know, working channels. There's, there's things that are going to be needed to be repaired. Um, at a much faster rate than, you know, maybe on the high level disinfection side or even when you go to manually soaking um, a scope. So they will get worn down over time, especially with more procedures, high volume, uh, you know, centers that use scopes, you know, lots of procedures a day or per week. Um, that's going to also in turn that they're going to be worn down quick. And that, again, repair costs could go higher. Uh, so when you move to reprocessing, as I said, sterilization, the more aggressive is also the more costly. Um, obviously, with the shift uh, towards, you know, a more aggressive reprocessing to ensure that these scopes are ready for patient use. And there's, that's going to require new equipment, uh, more advanced technology in this equipment, maybe even you know, refurbishing and redesigning a new room or adding a new room onto a facility to accompany that equipment, handle uh, what's needed for those reprocessing techniques. Uh, and there's also a lot of steps involved and there's a lot of training um, and maintaining competency. If there's, if there's quite a bit of turnover in a central sterile department, uh, there's going to be constant training and need of, of surveillance of the scopes and making sure that the scopes are clean, but also that these, um, the employees are also following each step uh, very thoroughly, because you'll see that that's not always the case. For the indirect cost, it is a cost is associated with treating an infection uh, that is obtained as a result of the uh, cross-contamination of a scope. So for the common infections that you would see, you know, particularly for a reusable bronchoscope, uh, would be pneumonia, ventilator-associated pneumonia. Uh, for a reusable duodenoscope, that would be sepsis. Um, as obviously, if you guys would imagine, within the last year and a half, COVID-19 transmission is also uh, a very valid concern. Uh, but there's a, a ring of other ways that cross-contamination is a, a large issue with, with multidrug-resistant organisms that are just susceptible to high level disinfections, other pathogen, pathogens. Uh, there's resistant eradication through biofilm for cleaning limitations and, and design issues. Uh, maybe things are heat sensitive, they don't tolerate sterilization. Pieces, parts of the scope don't tolerate sterilization um, as well as they do maybe high level disinfection. Um, there's hard to reach crevices in scopes. There's lots of very small openings that are very hard to reach. If they were scratches, again, hard to reach. It's hard to thoroughly get those, uh, those areas of a scope cleaned. Um, and there might be defects related to the reprocessing machinery uh, that have to be repaired. Um, and there's also that, that factor of human error. There are so many steps involved with reprocessing that the, it, there's, it's likely that a step may be missed or may not be as you know, down to the minute detail um, followed um, as designed. So next we will kind of, we'll go into the, the actual scope by scopes, your reusable doing scopes and bronchoscopes and a couple of others and break out what is the actual reusable cost per use. Uh, so here you see the total cost per use is for a reusable duodenoscope ranges between uh, about $1,413 to about $1,700. Um, in that bucket, you have the capital equipment. So that is the cost of the scope itself. Again, in the video towers, um, on the average cost per use for those investments would be $679 per use, whereas repairs could cost $182 per use. Uh, and reprocessing, here you see a large range because there are multiple ranges for duodenoscopes. You have single and double high level disinfection and sterilization. So you'll see that 80 to $406 range of reprocessing cost per use. And that cost 
cost of cross-contamination to treat a sepsis infection, which costs $472 per use. So when you compare that to the single use price, uh, which is at $1,695. So it, it sits in between the range, but you can see it is a cost-effective measure uh, dependent upon it in multiple factors. Um, also wanted to point out that Medicare traditional pass-through reimbursement is available for single use to do adenoscopes as well as inpatient um, reimbursement as well. For reusable bronchoscopes, uh, the reusable bronchoscope cost per use is around $656 per use. And that main, that incorporating in that is the capital equipment uh, where you see that again, the scopes for reusable bronchoscopes, video or HD video um, or fiber optic, it, it ranges, but $126 per use. Repairs averaging and coming out to be $99 per use. Uh, reprocessing, the high level disinfection of your reusable bronchoscope is $101 per use. And the cost to treat uh, or the cost of cross contamination is $330. And that is to treat the ventilator associated pneumonia. Uh, the single use price for reuse or for single use bronchoscope is ranged between $275 and $350. So when you take a look at the last, the next two is cystoscopes and rhinolaryngoscopes. The reusable cost of a cystoscope is $210. And you'll see the capital equipment cost on average per use is $51. The repair cost per use is $54 and reprocessing is $104. And you compare that to the single use uh, cost of a single use cystoscope is $175 to $225. Well, one thing to point out here, you'll notice that there is not that cross-contamination piece for these two scopes. Uh, it's not saying that there is an absolute zero risk for these. There just is not much, there are, have not been as many studies uh, conducted and readily available for these two types of scope, scopes compared to the previous two that really identify uh, that, that infection risk and that cost, but those, you know, you'll see some, some more data down the line. Uh, for rhinolaryngoscopes, the reasonable cost per use for a rhinolaryngoscope is $238. Capital equipment cost per use for a reusable rhinolaryngoscope is in, in tower associated with that is $50 per use. Repairs can be very costly. Uh, repairs can be much more often and frequent with, with reusable rhinolaryngoscopes. Uh, you see that at $161 per use. And then the reprocessing cost per use uh, for a reusable rhinolaryngoscope is $27. Now, the cost of the single-use rhinolaryngoscope ranges between $165 and $195. So you take a step back and, and you take a whole look at the big picture of the direct costs and the um, indirect costs, you'll see that single-use can be and is a cost-effective alternative uh, to reusable uh, scopes. And you, you can see on this nice table on the left that it breaks it out for you. And this is strictly for bronchoscopy. Uh, the percentage of each indirect cost bucket and the outcomes bucket, what percentage of the total cost it makes up. Uh, so, you know, the polling question, you guys are pretty, pretty, you know, close. Uh, outcomes do take up about 50% of the total cost. It is a very uh, it, it's a very expensive treatment and it's a, it's a risk, but the remaining portions of the, of the direct costs make up the majority. So you have the repairs uh, and your processing, which come out to be about 30% in total. And then the capital itself is about 19% of the total cost. And when you take a look on the cost comparison versus single use on the right hand side, you will see that on average, the total cost for a, bron a reusable bronchoscope comes out to be 656. And you can see that difference between single use and reusable of around $381. And you move down the table to cystoscopy, uh, where that total cost per use for reusable is 210. And you can see a difference up to $35 uh, when, you, when, when looking at single use cystoscopy. Uh, for ENT, you have that $238 per use cost for reusable. And you compare that to the single use cost, you can get a difference of up to $73. And then lastly, the ERCP for duodenoscope, uh, the reusable cost can range between $1,413 and to $1,739. You can see a difference of up to $44 for uh, the single use of duodenoscope for ERCPs. So flexible endoscope contamination and infection risk and the FDA's action. Third polling question for you all. Has the FDA issued any comments or guidance on reprocessing issues in support of single use? The FDA has not issued any comments or guidance or has the FDA issued support in transitioning towards single use for some endoscopes and recommending use for certain patient populations? 
most of you got it correct. It, the FDA has supported uh, transition to single use and recommended use of single use for very certain high risk populations. So we're gonna go a little more into that as well and, and these infection risk numbers. So we, we've touched on it a little bit, but this picture gives you a nice uh, summary of, of how complex uh, a reprocessing cycle can be. Uh, there's the pre-cleaning of the bedside pre-cleaning, you know, post-procedure at the site of use. Um, you got to you know, transport it to uh, maybe a central sterile apartment or an entirely different room, maybe a different arm. Uh, you got the manual cleaning, the rinsing, and you actually have the high-level disinfection cycle or the sterilization cycle. Again, transporting it maybe to a different, uh, to a different room, different arm, or maybe just down the hall. Uh, the drying and storage, the visual inspection, there's lots of, and this is a summary. So there's lots of other very fine details that have to be you know, followed uh, for a reprocessing cycle. It is extremely lengthy, time consuming, and it's very important that you know, each step is, is followed uh, very adamantly by the staff. And there's more than a hundred steps. And even when all of these steps are followed and followed particularly well you know, to the exact specification that's outlined in guidelines, it, it, contamination is still not an absolute, or excuse me, the risk of contamination is not an absolute zero. Um, it is still common. It is still seen amongst reusable bronchoscopes and reusable duodenoscopes. Um, and we'll move to the next, well, actually, yeah, I'll move to the next slide, that's fine. And when you take a look at the Joint Commission who has been following uh, and going in and, and, and observing hospitals, uh, their adherence to certain guidelines and the guidelines that continue to be published and more stringent guidelines, you'll see as the graph goes through the years from 2009 to 200, 2017, uh, more and more hospitals are found to be non-compliant with the high-level disinfection sterilization standards. Uh, this issue is still, you know, continuing to be more and more under the microscope. Uh, the, the, the reprocessing standards are continuing to be refined and more stringent. Uh, there, there's a large push from high levels of disinfection to sterilization, uh, which is a much more rigorous you know, process. There's a lot more steps involved. Uh, so there is going to be continuing monitoring of this non-compliance and to, to see if hospitals are adhering correctly uh, to every step of this process. Um, and as you remember, as you move from that HLD to sterilization, it's going to be a little bit more expensive. It's going to cost you more for uh, the, the materials and the machinery, the sterilization machine itself. Um, it's going to, and there's still not an absolute zero. There's still a risk involved. You take a look at reusable duodenoscope infection rates and the cost implications of these infections. Uh, there's a study that was done that was a systematic review of over 15 studies, so multiple different studies that identified uh, duodenoscope contamination uh, and then the infection rate. Uh, and you'll see that the, you know, that study found that 15.3% is the rate of duodenoscope contamination and about 1 to 2.5% is the infection rate. Uh, that is attributable to these re reusable duodenoscopes. So about one in 40 patients post-procedure uh, would acquire an infection. So when you take that infection rate and you multiply it by that average cost of treating infection, which is sepsis or ERCPs, you get your $472 cost of treating that infection per procedure. Uh, the infection rate itself is from a Stanford cost effectiveness analysis. So these are very thorough numbers that identified this infection rate and the rate of contamination for a reusable duodenoscope. The FDA also picked up on this. So the FDA began to monitor more and more of, of what, you know, what was happening with reusable scopes and contamination. So they actually mandated a surveillance study. Uh, it was conducted by the manufacturers of the reusable scopes and it found some really interesting things. 78% it, 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 of pre-cleaning steps in a reprocessing you know, cycle or process, 84% of manual cleaning steps, and 62% of high-level disinfection steps were either conducted uh, not to a standard or completely not conducted at all. They, they were just missed or not performed whatsoever. Um, so they, they found afterwards that they, they were hoping to find a much lower contamination rate, but it, it turns out 5% uh, of the properly collected samples tested positive for uh, a high concern organism. That is your Pseudomonas aeruginosa or your E. coli. Uh, so that's very, very important information from the FDA that they have, they have uncovered from this study regarding uh, the reprocessing steps and, and it's key to remember that that human factor where steps may be being missed or conducted poorly 
uh, whereas in, in, in that resulting infection rate, or excuse me, contamination rate. So then they released the uh, trans, well, they recommended this, well, they released a statement which recommended uh, either transitioning from reusable duty to scopes to single use or for um, at risk patients, but they recognize that that human factor, once again, that reprocessing is a lot of steps. There is a lot of very important steps that have, you know, you know particular measurements of, of, of solutions or detergents, things that need to be followed. Uh, so they definitely recommended moving from reusable DNSCOPES to uh, single use altogether, or you know even transitioning slowly to certain disposable components uh, to help maybe mitigate the this in fact this contamination rate. When you take a look at reusable bronchoscope contamination and infection rate, a uh, very similar risk of contamination uh, post. Uh, after a visual inspection post a reprocessing cycle, and you see it at 15%. And when you look at the infection rate that's attributable to the reasonable bronchoscopes, that's a tad higher, uh, about 2.8%. So one in 36 patients uh, will acquire an infection. And this, this infection rate is, that comes from a, a systematic review of 16 studies. Uh, so again, very thorough. It's multiple studies. It's not one site. It's not one particular study. It's multiple studies that took into account the infection rate. Uh, when you multiply that infection rate times the average cost of treating infection, which here in this case is ventilator-associated pneumonia, uh, you get a $330 cost of treating an infection. And the FDA also recognized that in reasonable bronchoscopy that this was a growing issue. Uh, so they also issued a safety communication this June uh, recommending single use bronchoscopes for high risk patients for the first time. Um, they, they obviously, it, it was very important to them to mitigate this, the, the growing concern of, an, of infections and cross contaminations. Um, and they recommended that either of you move to sterilization um, or you move to single use. If you move to sterilization, it, it is it, it can make workflow less efficient. Uh, disposable bronchoscopes um, and single use bronchoscopes are evolving quickly, so they're able to meet all the standards that you would need to use a bronchoscope across multiple procedures and departments. Um, they also acknowledged that there are unsolved problems that they're going to continue to monitor, and that's why they issued this recommendation. So when, you can, when you're concerned with single use products, uh, obviously we, we went through the history of reusables and how they have evolved over time um, and, their, and their quality and all the technology that goes involved. Uh, a concern may be, you know, how will a single use product line up uh, in, an, in clinically when you take a look at how it's work, how it works, is it, is it doing the same things? Is it, are you gonna lose any functionality uh, versus a, just a reusable scope. Uh, there was a study done here at the Mayo Clinic, or a survey, I should say, uh, that actually took a look at this. And it was a study that aimed to evaluate the efficiency and effectiveness of a single use rhino laryngoscope and compared it to their current reusable systems uh, that they were using during inpatient consults. It was a survey sent out to both residents and patients. And they, there was a Likert scale used in it was, there was a, each system was used for six weeks. So there was a lot of use for both to, to really develop what, what was the, the comparison, what was really the uh, end all be all of, of how well does this scope work when you line it up to reusables and the surveys and they came back very, very positive. So there's, there's, there's no concern. You know, the patient surveys demonstrated that single use scopes um, helped the patient's understanding of disease. Um, the rationale of treatment for recommendations. It was not more painful for patients than their, 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 the previous reusable system. And a reusable scope was not needed at any time when using a single use system uh, to, to complete a procedure. Uh, the residents themselves, those who use the scopes, uh, they, they, were, they noted it, it rated significantly higher on the time to complete a consult. Uh, they rated higher for teaching opportunities and the ease of communications and findings uh, to patients and recommending treatments, helping that patient understand what they're seeing. Um, they, multiple scope examinations were not required for a single you know, consult, and they overall rated it higher uh, for the ease of use. So single use scopes are, are up to par and, and you know, from a functionality standpoint and in the technology standpoint. So there is no, you know, you see the cost side, you see the, the actual functionality side as well. So the other uh, part, we've talked a lot about the cost and cost effectiveness, but um, what we what we mentioned briefly also in the beginning was one of the main drivers is the efficiency, the workflow improvements, which actually 
uh, um, can can help generate additional revenue for facilities. And um, um, before we dig into that topic, uh, let's look at this uh, latest driver and, and think about your facility and what would what do you think would be the main driver for your hospital to consider single-use endoscope? Is it the uh, support that's coming out from the FDA uh, and the safety um, communications around reusable? Is it the economics? Um, is it perhaps that it might be better for, for patients? So it's a patient perspective or, or all of the above? Or is it none of this really relevant in the decision to transition to uh, uh, single-use technology? So all of the above, uh, very interesting. And I think uh, that's also what we see that typically these decisions are not taken by a single stakeholder in the hospitals. It's usually uh, a value analysis uh, decision that of course has representation from clinical, from finance uh, uh, and from um, the medical directors, et cetera. So really all of these aspects are considered uh, in that decision. So I'm, I want to be mindful of time and have time for, uh, for the Q&A session. But really, as I mentioned, one of the things we, we haven't talked that much about is really the improvement in workflows. And, and if you have uh, certain types of endoscopy procedures that are very high volume, uh, where hospitals do a, a ton of these, um, then uh, any even small improvements in productivity can actually have a substantial impact on the bottom line. And one of these high volume procedures that uh, are in the hospitals uh, is cystoscopy. So cystoscopy is um, required, uh, surveillance cystoscopy is required when you have bladder cancer and it's used to, of course, diagnose a host of lower urinary uh, tract uh, issues. Uh, so it's a high volume procedure in the hospital outpatient clinic. And, and um, one of the things that we, we've seen in a lot of facilities is that the reusable setup and the reusable technology, because the scope sometimes break during procedures or reprocessing is delayed, or when the scope is delivered to the physician, it doesn't have all the components they need to do the procedure. Oftentimes they have to be very conservative in the amount of time uh, that they uh, set aside for scheduling a patient to do the procedure. So this is a, um, a, an example of a clinic in San Diego that used to do uh, or, or used to schedule patients in one hour increments because they needed to have enough time to uh, deal with these uh, inefficiencies. And uh, what they saw after implementing uh, single use was they could actually take that time down from one hour to just 15 minutes. And of course, that has a significant impact in the amount of patients they can see and the amount of revenue that the hospital can generate from, from these procedures. So uh, just as an example, uh, this is uh, a, um, an example of uh, a hospital. If you just uh, reduce the procedure with, with five minutes, then even five minutes uh, and adding, uh, you know, uh, a little over a hundred procedures uh, can really have a significant impact on, on the revenue and, and gross profit that uh, an outpatient clinic can, can deliver for the hospital. So, so for these high volume procedures, it's really, it's not so much the uh, infection control concern, it's really about the efficiencies that this allows the hospital to, to get from, from implementing uh, single use. The other thing that's very, uh, you know, that that's a big issue right now is, is um, of course, with with the um, COVID uh, situation, uh, a lot of uh, procedures just simply wasn't done, uh, and so there's a build up of this large backlog of procedures that hospitals have to work through now. And um, there's a study that came out from from McKinsey basically saying that. In general, hospitals had to operate at 10% above baseline volume for around 20 months to get rid of this backlog. 
And then this is a, a, an issue for hospitals that have basically designed their capital for a certain patient volume, and they might not need to be designed for a certain, certain uh, surge of, of 10% over uh, you know, a fairly short period of time. So the hospital has to decide, do I invest in additional capital that I might not need 12 months down the road? So in this type of situation, single use as it's a variable cost, it, the cost of single use endoscopy varies with the amount of procedures. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, something that's definitely very uh, useful um, in a situation like this, where you basically don't have to invest in a large capital, you can just uh, make the needed investment on a, on a on a needed basis, and uh, you you have certainty that the cost will vary uh, based on the um, the uh, procedure volume you have. What we saw, of course, uh, is um, during a, a situation uh, like COVID, where procedure volumes uh, fell, uh, you know, fifty percent for four or five months. Um, financially. The, uh, the the depreciation costs uh, are still there. Uh, uh, that capital that sits on the balance sheet still has to be uh, depreciated. But um, and so there's a, a there's a financial cost for the system to have uh, that uh, capital sitting on the balance sheet. Whereas single use in that period of time with less procedures, then the variable costs would just have gone down and, and matched the, uh, the level of procedures. So that's certainly also something that's uh, attractive to, to hospitals uh, in this uh, situation. So uh, I think let, I think we, we, we uh, I think we've gone through uh, uh, the, um, the presentation and hopefully you get an appreciation that it's not just one thing that's driving this market towards single use. It's really a variety of, of uh, drivers uh, from cost efficiencies to workflows to productivity uh, and, uh, of course, elimination of uh, cost contamination uh, from endoscopes. So a lot of uh, drivers. And so uh, this, this is something that more and more hospitals are seeing and uh, I would say uh, the majority of hospitals these days have transitioned to uh, single use uh, in some clinical areas, but I think you will start to see um, requests from your clinicians of uh, uh, consideration for adopting single use in, in more and more uh, clinical areas and for more and more clinical procedures as these single use devices become better and, and, and uh, um, more cost efficiently uh, moving forward as well. So um, with that, I think we would open it up for, for questions. Thank you, Jens and Ian, for that engaging presentation. First question is, where is single use having the most impact currently? So uh, the, um, the first single use scopes that were introduced to the market were bronchoscopes. And so um, about a third of the procedures that are using bronchoscopes in the OR uh, and in the ICU uh, have now converted to single use. So of the top 500 hospitals in the U.S., 98% of them have adopted uh, single-use bronchoscopes. And in general, there's more than 2,500 hospitals uh, using bronchoscopes. Um, and then, of course, there's other uh, areas as well that have had uh, significant adoption. So single-use uh, ureteroscopes for upper urinary tract uh, management uh, have had uh, a lot of adoption. Uh, cystoscopes uh, are, are really getting a very strong adoption very quickly and the same for uh, single-use uh, ENT scopes. So I would say it's really across the board. Where we haven't seen a lot of adoption yet has been in the GI area, but um, I think that will change now that um, more companies are looking to introduce uh, single-use devices in the GI space. Uh, and I think the technology is now mature enough that uh, it can meet the, a lot of the requirements uh, for, the, for the GI area. Next question is, what do you think about the increasing literature related to reprocessing of SUDs? Uh, 
what do I think about the literature? So there's a lot of literature out there. Um, there's a lot of infection control experts that is, of course, looking at this. And I think um, what it tells me is that um, there's still work to be done to find an effective reprocessing uh, method. Um, I think uh, there are multiple studies demonstrating now that even with sterilization, uh, it, it for flexible uh, scopes, it's it's very difficult to eliminate the uh, cross contamination risk uh, for certain products, and and um, I think uh, I think that's what I take away from these studies is that it's it's even if you follow all the guidelines and all the steps uh, in detail you still end up with a, a contamination risk. Uh, and, and I think the more, you know, can you do more? Yes, uh, there are probably even more stringent requirements that could be implemented, but it's just going to make the process even more expensive and, and even more labor uh, intensive and, and time consuming. So uh, at some point, I, I think it's, I don't think it's the answer. Thank you. Do either of you have any closing remarks? No, I, uh, I thank you very much for uh, allowing us to, to uh, be here today and, and hope you all uh, enjoyed this session. We are uh, definitely open to answer additional questions. So you have our emails here and, and cell phone numbers. We're very happy to share additional information uh, if you have uh, any additional questions. So feel free to, to reach out to both uh, Ian and I. And with that, we have reached the conclusion of today's webinar. I would like to thank our speakers for presenting and AMBU for sponsoring. We hope you have found the presentation informative. Thank you for your participation and have a great day.